And so our next speaker is Nada Zodi. She is the director of the OpenGov Hub, a theme center in our network in Washington, DC, that is aptly focused on government transparency. And as I was like working on what I should say to, in, to introduce Nada, there's just too many things to things to, to mention. So most recently, she has actually had an article published in the Stanford Social Innovation Review. So pretty proud of that. It's so cool. So without further ado, I will let her take it away about talking about all of these different lessons in collaboration. Thank you so much. Uh, hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, you can hear me okay? Awesome. Um, yeah, and that article is actually what I'm here to talk about, so even better. Um, I should have brought copies. I, I thought about it, but didn't have time. Um, but um, anyway, so yeah, good morning. Um, again, my name is Netta Zodi, and I'm from uh, the Open Gov Hub in Washington, D.C., um, which has been a part of the NCN network for a couple years now. Um, and I'm really excited to talk to you today about this idea of catalytic collaboration. Um, so to kick us off, um, I want to start off with an image, which should look very familiar. It may be a little bit grainy, uh, so bear with me. But um, does anyone here in the audience just want to shout out what do you see in this picture? Car keys. Exactly. Yeah, car keys in the ignition, right? Um, so I want to start us off here because um, this is something that most of us probably do on a daily basis, many times a day, without even taking a second to think about it, right? Basically, there, but there's something kind of magical which happens where, um, you know, one minute we're sitting in this hunk of thousands of pounds of metal, basically, and the next minute we turn, you know, turn our keys in, in the ignition and then suddenly we're kind of off uh, zooming along our way. Um, so just to take a second to think about, like, what transformation took place in that split second, um, that's something that we could call a process of catalysis. Um, so basically putting your keys in the, uh, you know, ignition and turning it on, um, you know, catalyzes and sparks a process that takes you, um, you know, from being in one place to a completely different uh, place in the next moment. Um, and so I want to start us off with this analogy this morning um, because I think it's actually a pretty powerful way to think about um, catalyzing collaboration as nonprofit centers. Um, so just in the most basic sense, you know, what exactly is a catalyst? Um, well, a catalyst is really anything that can, you know, spark or uh, stimulate or accelerate some kind of significant or radical transformation. Um, and basically, what I'm really here to kind of argue today, and I think this will be a receptive audience, um, is that you know, at the end of the day, I really think our number one jobs um, as center, nonprofit center operators is to be catalysts of community um, and to really be the very best connectors of people that we can possibly be. Um, and, uh, you know, so I've been running the Open Gov Hub now for a couple years. Um, and trust me, I, I totally understand that of all people, it, sometimes it really feels like people in our roles are um, so often pulled in so many different directions, right? So like on a typical day, if you're someone like me, you may find yourself, you know, one minute um, spending time onboarding a new member organization. Um, the next minute, maybe you're moderating a public panel for an event. Later in the day, maybe you're negotiating with, you know, the building uh, management. Um, we're constantly kind of being pulled in all these different directions. Um, but um, over the last couple of years, from the work that we've been doing, I really do firmly believe that uh, it's always helpful to take this step back and, and push pause and just rem ask ourselves, really, um, are we sparks that are igniting kind of engines of collaboration, if you bear with me in the analogy? Um, you know, are we really being the best connectors of people that we can be in order to transform the effectiveness of our member organizations um, to have the most social impact? Um, and, and the last thing I'll say on this point is I honestly believe that, like, this is true not just for all of us, but for really anyone who's so committed to social change. Um, you know, connecting people and resources is the key to really scaling our impact. Um, so, um, before I get into the meat of this idea of catalytic collaboration, um, I first want to give you just a little more orientation to my community um, and uh, to this whole notion of open government or open gov. Um, because I know, uh, you know, we have a kind of wonky, jargony name. Um, I'm often finding myself, you know, explaining to people what it is exactly um, that we focus on and, and why we exist as a center. Um, so, um, so just to, to do that today, I just want to give you a quick anecdote to kick us off. Um, uh, because, you know, promoting open government reforms all around the world um, is really the whole reason that we exist, um, to, to enable this community and this movement to have more impact. 
Um, so, okay, so yeah, what is open government exactly? Um, so for the example I want to share this morning, um, it will take us to the Philippines, to the other side of the world. Um, and the story starts uh, a little more than a decade ago, um, where basically um, some research was done at a local university in Manila, um, which basically uncovered something pretty shocking, uh, which was that billions of dollars, uh, sorry, billions of pesos, the local currency, um, uh, of, of government and taxpayer money was uh, basically disappearing um, because this was money that was coming from the Ministry of Education to buy and deliver textbooks to schools all across the country. Um, and in almost you know, 40% of the cases, um, this wasn't actually taking place, right? So the government was spending uh, money to get textbooks delivered to all levels of schools all across the country, um, and, and there was a problem. Um, this wasn't actually happening. There was some corruption taking place. Um, so, um, so clearly, you know, people within the government were really frustrated uh, because they were spending resources but not actually delivering this key essential service to communities. Um, and of course, parents were also very frustrated that, you know, this was really hurting um, their children's chance of having even a basic quality education because they couldn't even have access to those ma uh, most basic resources. Um, so what happened was uh, a program which uh, became known as G-Watch, um, where people within the government and citizens um, came together to solve this problem um, and to basically educate and mobilize um, uh, countless citizens to kind of serve as like the eyes and ears of government and monitor every step of the process to ensure that these textbooks were actually being delivered. Um, and especially to kind of more rural, remote regions, uh, which were suffering the most from this problem. Um, and I really like there was a lot of creativity here, actually, because they also engaged um, Boy Scout troops all across the country to be involved in the process. Um, and so, um, and, and this program was supported by one of our member organizations called the Partnership for Transparency. Um, so anyway, so the reason I like to start us off here is because um, I think this gives you an idea of the power of open government. Um, so it's an example of a time that people were able to come together to really address a serious problem of corruption, um, and at the same time to really mobilize citizens um, to make sure that their governments were being honest and were delivering key services to, to people um, in communities across the country. Um, so yeah, so just to kind of summarize what I've just said, uh, officially when we talk about open government, we're basically talking about three key ideas. Um, the first is that whole notion of transparency. So providing access to information about like what are governments actually doing? What are the programs? How are they spending their money? Um, and this is really the foundation for all of the work. Um, the next key pillar is, is moving towards accountability, right? So holding people in power to account and making sure that um, you know, integrity is taking place. Um, and the last key principle is on participation and engagement. Um, so mobilizing citizens and really strengthening that relationship. Um, so that's kind of what it is that we do and what our community is really passionate about. Um, but in terms of who we are, uh, we started about five years ago. Um, and we've grown to be a community now that includes um, over 40 organizations, um, about 225 people, um, and the vast majority of whom do have this global development focus. Um, uh, uh, and you see a couple pictures of our, of our space in downtown DC here. Um, so, um, so to, now that you've kind of gotten that background and context, I want to get into the details of what does it mean, again, to catalyze collaboration. Um, so what I'm about to share is actually coming from some research that I was able to, um, uh, a research team that I was part of a couple years ago um, at Harvard, where we were basically trying to uh, explore and learn about innovative forms of nonprofit collaboration. Um, so we got to look to over 30, get to know over 30 different organizations, uh, nonprofits working on all sorts of issues from education to health and others. Um, and we discovered that there was a, a kind of pattern which emerged from a handful of those groups which really seemed to be having an outsized impact uh, when it comes to collaboration. So um, I want to present this framework which we call catalytic collaboration, uh, which basically just has four parts, um, and then talk about how we've been applying it. Um, okay, so again, what is catalytic, catalytic collaboration? Um, so the first key principle here is to emphasize um, shared learning. Um, and this may sound straightforward, um, but I actually think it can often take a little bit of kind of courage, especially to be one of the first organizations, to be really open and honest with your peers about what's working and what isn't um, in the, prob you know, the problem that you're trying to solve. 
Um, and, and it's really important for those organizations to take that step forward and, and be open about what they're learning for the sake of benefiting their entire field. Um, this can really set a good precedent. Um, so, so shared learning is the first uh, principle. The second principle for catalytic collaboration is this whole idea of systems thinking and acting. Um, so I'm sure a lot of us are, have probably heard of this whole notion of systems thinking. Um, but specifically, what we mean here is a really intentional um, emphasis on mapping out the networks of actors surrounding the problem that you're focused on and the kind of systemic underlying causes that are driving it. Um, and, and so, you know, mapping out is kind of step one, um, and obviously uh, there's uh, really important reasons to be doing that. But then step two is helping gr different actors coordinate who are solving different pieces of the puzzle. Um, so that's kind of the, the idea here. The third principle is democratizing access to assets. Um, you may not be surprised that I like the whole notion of democratizing things. Um, <laughs> um, but what we, so, so, and of course, nonprofit centers are, are really good at this, right? We exist to kind of help groups share resources. Um, but I want to encourage everyone here to really think um, creatively about how we define assets. Um, so what are the resources that can really enable our members or our tenants to have greater impact in their work? Um, and the last principle in this framework is long-term relationship building. Um, okay, so this is, you know, the framework for catalytic collaboration. Um, so now what I want to do is uh, walk you through how we've actually been trying to implement this um, to, to see better results um, in my community. Um, so first off, I'm really happy to report, especially as I was thinking about last, being at uh, last year's gathering um, and uh, getting to know the NCM community. Um, so this year has been really exciting for us at the Open Gov Hub um, for a lot of reasons, but I think one of the biggest reasons is that um, this is the first time we've ever actually implemented a strategy behind better fulfilling our mission um, and promoting, you know, rich and authentic collaboration. Um, and so we've, we've been experimenting a lot and learning a lot in the process, um, and I want to share that with you today. Um, and um, uh, part of, of what we've seen take place is that we've been able to, to help facilitate over 125 different events and activities uh, so far this year. We're probably on track to do like 150 or so this year. Um, but even, you know, far more important than that, um, for me, when I kind of take a step back, um, what I'm most proud of is seeing a real culture shift that's taken place for us over the past year um, to really becoming a far more kind of open uh, community where people are constantly kind of getting to know one another as individuals and finding more and better ways to, to uh, work on shared problems together. Um, so again, I'm going to try to deconstruct where we think some of that is coming from. Um, and just quickly, um, you know, we, maybe we can talk more about this uh, later, but I'm sure a lot of us often are trying to think about how do we actually measure our progress when it comes to promoting collaboration. Um, we look at a number of different metrics, but one of the most important ones for us has been thinking about collective identity. Uh, so basically we do surveys of our members and we ask them how they see themselves as a hubber, a member of the Open Gov Hub community, um, compared to as a staff person of their organization. Um, and we've been seeing some excited progress on that uh, this year, which I'm, I'm really happy about um, and we, we hope will continue. Um, so anyway, so, so again, like we have this four-part framework for catalytic collaboration. How have we actually been applying it um, at the Open Gov Hub? Um, so again, to take this first principle of shared learning, um, I could actually, you know, kind of give you a laundry list of all of the activities which we've tried to organize around promoting learning, right? So for example, we have you know, workshops, we have working groups, we have skill shares, uh, we have all sorts of different activities. But rather than kind of going into the weeds on that, um, I kind of just want to emphasize this picture. <laughs> uh, because I think, so, so this picture was taken at our annual open house uh, just a couple months ago. Um, and what you see is one of our newer member organizations um, doing like a lightning talk. Uh, but they decided to make a Wheel of Fortune game, basically, um, to help introduce their work to their peers. Um, and I just love this picture so much because you can like look at every single face basically and see um, how much people are enjoying themselves in the process. Um, and so again, when I take a step back, like it, when, whenever any of us think about when are the times that we've learned most effectively, it you know, tends to be in environments that we're comfortable, um, where we're comfortable you know, guessing and trying new things and failing and learning and growing in the process. Um, and so I think for us, that means that we need to be really thoughtful about 
how do we create these learning environments that are conducive for people opening up and sharing both their successes and their failures and, and for the sake of everyone improving. Um, so, um, so yeah, so there's, uh, so there's that. And then another quick example, uh, which I'm also uh, really happy about, is something else we've started this year is um, monthly blog posts, which we call our In Case You Missed It uh, posts, um, which are basically quick roundups of three takeaways from each of the major events that we've organized that month. Um, because probably like a lot of you, I had a lot of our community members telling me, um, you know, I love our calendar of events, it's so awesome, but I'm so busy, right? And I can't always make it to these brown bags and, and other activities. Um, and so we were like, okay, we can close this feedback loop or learning loop a little bit better um, by, you know, without spending too much time or energy, by just pulling out three quick ideas from the big uh, events that we're organizing um, and sharing that back both with our community and with the public through our blog. So um, second principle, again, is on the systems thinking and acting. Um, really awesome to be talking about networks and network mapping. And I'm by no means an expert, so I, I'm almost afraid to now present the slide. <laughs> um, but I will tell you that um, what we started to do over the past year is um, basically formalize our onboarding process whenever we get a new group uh, join our community, where we have a standardized template that they fill out to give us a profile of who they are and what they focus on. Um, and a really simple but key part of this process is that we ask them to pick their top three keywords which describe the work that they're doing from a list which we've developed, right? Because everyone kind of uses our own specialized language of like, oh yeah, we're the experts of XYZ, but sometimes we're actually talking about very similar concepts without knowing it. Um, so this simple step has actually been really helpful because once the groups identify their three key words, we can pop them into this network map um, and see, you know, from the get-go, who are they, who should they be connecting with? Um, so in this particular tool, um, the, all the black nodes are the organizations, and all the colored ones are the different issues that they share, like open data and sustainable development and, and other things. Um, so this has been a really helpful way for us to start to visualize the connections and then get people, you know, get people to hit the ground running with connecting with, with others. Um, so the third uh, principle, again, is democratizing access to assets. Um, again, we, I think we should think about assets not just as physical resources, um, but, but things that organizations really need. Um, so what you see here is an example that came from a workshop series we did on business development. Um, so of course, you know, fundraising is a real pain point, if not the single biggest pain point for, for most nonprofits. Um, and this was really cool because actually one of the individuals who participated in this workshop, she started to create a database, basically a funding pipeline database, uh, because she needed to do this for, as part of her job. Um, and then she realized in the course of the workshops how much there was overlap with some of the groups. Um, so, um, so she started off this kind of funding pipeline, and now someone from our team is taking this up to kind of keep it and maintain it as a living resource. Um, that all of our members can have access to, just to kind of simplify that initial step of, of doing a lot of the legwork and research on exploring different types of funders um, to connect with. Um, so finally, the fourth trait of this model of catalytic collaboration is uh, really investing in relationship building. Um, and I, again, when I take a step back, I really think this is kind of the single most important piece of the puzzle. Um, so I'm going to spend a little more time here and just share a couple of reflections that we've had and examples of, of how we're working on this. Um, so first off, uh, you know, this, this is, I think, a really powerful principle to think about, which is how every community um, you know, has its traditions which define it. Um, and so what you see here is a photo of our single most popular, uh, well-attended community tradition, which we call Waffle Wednesdays. Um, we started this about a year ago. And uh, on the first Wednesday of each month, um, we serve up waffles in the main shared space. And it's a really great time for people to you know, get to know each other, um, update each other on what they're working on, and just start their day. Um, and this is the photo from the very first Waffle Wednesday. But um, again, this may seem small, but it's something that I've seen and heard a lot of our members share with other people. They're starting to become better ambassadors for us as the Open Gov Hub because they're, you know, they're identifying with traditions which we have um, and that can, can be uh, making a big difference in setting a culture. Um, so another uh, related idea here is how important I think it is to establish like easy predictable rhythms that people can engage in without 
losing two hours of their workday. <laughs> um, so this is an another tradition which I really love. Uh, we started called our weekly whiteboards. Um, we have a big rolling whiteboard that we station right up near our coffee bar uh, where everyone is passing through at some point in the day. Um, and at the start of each week, we just put a prompt. Um, most of the time, this actually has nothing to do with what, like work, right? It's, it's things that you see up here, like what's your favorite childhood book? Uh, what music are you listening to? What are you excited about for fall? A any number of different things. Um, but it's been really cool to see people really pick this up again as a tradition. So as you're going to get your coffee, you know, grabbing a marker and, and kind of crowdsourcing responses on topics. Um, the one on the left is, was like, what's your favorite podcast? It became a kind of contentious debate topic for the week in our office. Um, we probably had more responses to this than any other prompt. Um, but I, you know, I love that even just personally as a, an avid listener of podcasts, this literally, I took a photo of this and it gave me you know, a, a vetted list of podcasts to listen to for the next year. Like it's the little things that, that make us you know, feel like we're benefiting from the community and also contributing to it in different ways. Um, okay, so a couple more just lessons that, that we're reflecting on. Um, this you know, is, is incredibly important to think about how are we actually empowering other people to be leading. Um, so you heard me say you know, we've done 125 different activities so far this year. There is no way our team of two full-time folks could have pulled that off without uh, supporting a, a community of about, about a dozen people for us um, who have really stepped up to lead any number of different activities. Um, and so what you see here are ex examples of two of our like, collaboration leaders uh, running activities which help them do their job better, help them build skills that they're excited about, and things like this. So how can we constantly think about enabling others to be leading? Um, and then this, uh, I, I like I want to remind myself first and foremost of, because um, trust me, I, like, I love strategizing, I love plans, I love spreadsheets, like that's kind of the person that I am. Um, but again, like I think the, the big lesson that I've learned so far is um, how much culture is really what can define people's experiences. And by that, I mean, um, you know, how people feel about a place and about others uh, really influences so much, like us wanting to get out of bed and go to work in the morning. Um, and so how can we constantly think about creating, an, you know, creating strategies and plans that enable a culture shift um, that creates the kind of community and collaboration which we seek? Um, oh, ping pong definitely helps. <laughs> um, so um, yeah, just because you know, again, like I, I really think that um, when we take a step back and think about this this kind of inherent you know human desire for connection and feeling a sense of belonging, uh, both you know a sense of belonging to a community which is larger than us, but also to an idea or a mission or a purpose which is larger than us, you know, is probably one of the single biggest motivators of human behavior out there. So how can we be really smart and thoughtful about engaging this in a way that um, really lifts everyone up to have more impact in the work that they're doing? Um, and so just to kind of help bring to a close, um, I do want to uh, end on a, a bit of a challenge um, for us and, and you know, for us as a community as a whole, which um, is how can we think about enabling these connections and relationship building in a more kind of rapid fire way um, of course, meaningful relationship building can take a lot of time, um, but I think we are, as a, as a sector uh, and as nonprofit centers, are getting to a point where we should really be thinking about um, you know, enabling just enough connection that allows people to establish trust and rapport and I uncover their shared interests and their shared needs um, and to be exchanging value in that, in that sense. Um, so yeah, so again, to just kind of conclude and bring us back home, um, like I really do strongly believe that our number one job, first and foremost, is to be these catalysts of community. Um, because no matter what social issue that you're passionate about, you know, whether it's opening governments or empowering women or um, feeding uh, the hungry or anything else, you know, I really do believe that these problems are far too complicated, urgent, and important for any of us to be tackling alone. So thank you. Thank you so much, Net Netta. Yes. Yep. I'm going to get it right <laughs> one of these days. Are there questions for Netta? So our center hasn't launched yet. So we've been talking to a lot of centers around the country. And the things that you talked about around community building, relationship building, make a lot of sense. The collaboration piece, from what I'm hearing, is much harder. One center I spoke to said that until they made funding available, 
to their tenants to fund collaborative projects. It just didn't happen because everybody had the best of intentions. Everyone was just too busy, so overwhelmed to make it. So I just wonder what your experience with, is with, beyond the relationship building, the actual collaboration. Yeah, definitely. Um, so uh, probably the best example I can give here is um, through four working groups which we have on four themes, which are challenges for a number of different organizations uh, that, again, have been running since the start of, of this year. Um, so basically what we've tried to do is create, is, is to, first of all, um, really make sure we have a, an acute understanding of what each person needs and what they can give. Um, so I actually, I picked this up from uh, Pat uh, Smith from Denton, Texas. I don't know if he's watching maybe, but at last year's, um, at last year's NCN gathering, uh, he talked about pains and passions, right? And again, seeing our jobs as constantly being updated on like, what's your pain, what's your passion? Like what's a real issue in your day-to-day -day work and what are you super excited to share? Um, and so we've kind of designed these working groups around collecting information on that, those topics. Um, and we've seen some, some good success. So I would say, like, for example, the working groups meet once a month, um, but we haven't been able to, to have huge asks of how much work people invest in between meetings, right? Because, yeah, everyone is busy and has long to-do lists. Um, but uh, what we have been able to do is through getting a, a regular habit of people sharing information about what they're working on and sharing connections, um, to start to kind of seed bigger project ideas, which we're now starting to, to try to, you know, uh, help them pursue funding around. So I think it's, it, yeah, like it's, it, I think it's all connected. It's the, the culture and the environment, which enables people to actually openly share what they're learning and working on, and then getting traction and kind of piloting lots of new ideas, seeing which ones really seem to have a lot of buy-in, and then leveraging as much resources as we can to, to sustain those, basically, and help them take off. Yeah. We have a question online um, wondering how you phrase the survey question to get to that 20% um, increase in hub collective identity. Yes, great question. So uh, I'm sure, again, I'm no survey expert or anything, but for us, we, we settled on a uh, scale from one to five question. Well, there's a couple, but one of them says, uh, you know, I see the open gov hub as more than a shared space. That's a piece of it. Um, and, uh, and that kind of helps get us to some of the collective identity stuff. And then and I didn't mention this, but we also uh, definitely, for, since our first survey, we've always asked, like, do you collaborate with others? Can you give us examples? Um, and have started to learn more about, like, who are the key nodes in the network who seem to be funneling a lot of those uh, connections. Right. And just one more. Um, someone's wondering if they can get access to the template for that database spreadsheet that had the names and focus areas for your members. Yes, and if definitely. that's a CRM yeah, and, tool, or a tool or Excel spreadsheet only. Yes, yeah, the, the tool that you saw up there actually is called Airtable. Um, this is something, again, I learned from someone in our community, which um, is basically like Excel on steroids or something. Like it's, it, Airtable uh, can be really cool, useful, uh, kind of simple database uh, tools, which enable you to sort and, and kind of make use of lots of different types of information. But yeah, I'm happy to share that. Awesome. Other questions? Keep those live stream questions coming. Isis? Um, so I wonder, how do you handle organizations whose culture may not be conducive to participating? <laughs> There's a lot behind that question. I can feel it. Um, my, yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's great. It's, uh, I think my short answer and my, you know, like, is that we try to create, like, the bandwagon effect, right? We try to to illustrate to people there's something cool going on, there's a dance party happening, and you're missing out. And, like, and, and it's true, there's definitely still organizations which I know share so much in common with others, and I don't see stepping up and participating as much as I'd like. And that's, you know, that can be frustrating. Um, but I, I do think it's, it's, um, it's really being public and visible about what is happening. So let me give you a really quick example. Again, it's small, but I think it was important. Um, the photos that you saw, here. Um, this was uh, from our kind of kickoff event at the start of the year to announce all the different act activities we we're going to organize. And rather than doing it in our event space where we normally host kind of bigger events for our members, we decided to basically take over our common space, our cafe. Um, and so that 
so that we, so people would see what was happening um, and do it in the middle of the workday, right, around lunchtime, and, and, and make it a little more of an opt-out thing than an opt-in thing, right? Like, you have to pass through this space anyway. There's a couple sign-up sheets. There's a couple fun activities where you can vote on things. It's, it's not a heavy lift. Um, so how can we really, like, come to people, get in their face a little bit without being, you know, aggressive, but, but show people like, hey, this is what's happening. People are getting together. It's fine if you don't want to participate, but this is, um, this is where we're headed as a community. Yeah. You mentioned that there were about 12 people that are kind of those leaders. I was curious how you found those people and how you keep them engaged and what exactly you do to kind of empower them to lead other things for the community. Yeah, definitely. Um, so for the most part, they, you know, they came to us in some way or another. A lot of it was just the individual relationships that me and my colleague have with folks who, on a regular basis, were coming to us and suggesting, like, hey, you know, I'm a communications person. I know there are other communications people here, and I want to get their feedback and connect with them, right? So they, they kind of revealed themselves, I would say. Um, but it's, it's been really important for us to make sure that they feel supported and to regularly check in with them. Um, for example, we did an appreciation lunch for them recently, which uh, also allowed us to collect their feedback to shape um, the open house, which you saw. So uh, we've been trying to show them how their efforts are really paying off and how we prioritize their feedback when it comes to designing things for the whole community. Um, and there's actually been some staffing changes recently, which unfortunately have shrunk this group down back to like seven or eight. So now we're kind of trying to do a little bit of recruiting again. But it's really acknowledging that, um, consistently checking in with them. And again, like closing that feedback loop, showing them like, hey, two months ago you said we really need to fix the annou weekly announcement slides that we do. Did you see this week's announcement slides? Something like that. So. Awesome. So let, help me thank Nada. Nada.